This is Wandering Universe. Today, I'll be exploring another place somewhere in the arid ranges of the Middle East. So, put your seat upright, fold your tray tables away, and fasten your seatbelt, because we're about to land. Are you ready? Let's go exploring. As you can see in front of you, this is the map of Old Mesopotamia. The place we're going today is not Uruk, and it's not Ur, and it's not Iridu, but somewhere, a little place, if you see where my arrow is pointing, slotted in between these two neighbouring towns is a place that I'm going to be exploring with you today. This is the same map, once again. So there's a little township slotted in between Ur and Uridu, and this is the map called the extension of the Ubad culture between 5,900 to 4,300 BC. So this is an ancient civilization that goes a very long way. For years, I've had a curious sensation about this particular civilization. Not for their cultural living and aspects, it's something else beyond comprehension. I'll get into the guts of that interesting insight shortly, but first, let me take you on a little tour of the area that was once known as Ubad, or it is known today as Tel Al Ubad, is situated west of Ur in southern Iraq in a region called Di Qua Governorate. The Ubad civilization began around 6500 and ended around 3800 BC. It was a civilization that had existed in the Mesopotamia period and as you can see this map in front of you this just shows the Fertile Crescent and the expanse of Mesopotamia itself. So it starts down here where Sumer, Eridu and Ur is and Uruk and then expands all the way up to the Fertile Crescent around southern parts of Turkey, the Mediterranean Sea and they call it the lower part of Egypt, but I call it the upper part of Egypt and a little bit of the Sinai region. It was a sub-branch created by the Sumerians who came from Samara in Iraq. They made their first settlement in Eridu in the Ubad period in the 6th millennium BC all the way to 5300 BC. It evolved during the Bronze Age. They were also succeeded by the Halaf culture which began around 6100 to 5400 BC and this is what's left of the Halaf culture settlement as you can see here. They settled in the alluvial plains in southern Mesopotamia. It was a cultural society that lasted until around the Uruk period in 4000 BC. So as you can see this is what you see the alluvial plains in southern Iraq that meets up with the coastal edge of the Persian Gulf. The Ubad civilization was an up and happening place. It was bright, boisterous and a newly established city that almost never slept. It was once a tiny country town like any other that relied solely on farming. It was a sleepy farming community that made their wealth through selling their goods and services to nearby townships such as Uruk, Irudu, Ur, and many more. Whilst their farming enterprise grew into a profit-making economy, using their business smarts, they began to develop a new business proposition of making pottery. This civilization was known for its huge pottery industry, yet there is a lot more to it than just what you've been told. They adopted brand new technology called the wheel, as you can see in front of you. This new technology was a vital means to living a prosperous society, and why not? This technology was then applied to a pottery machine with the wheel attachment, as you can see in this illustration right there. So the wheel is attached to the base leg, and then they use the foot to move 
the spin, or should I say spin the wheel around in order to form a pottery shape, as you can see right here. A genius machine, may I say. Ubaid developed from a sleeping farming township into a thriving urban city. All thanks to another new technology, this enabled them to control a trade route that stretched from the Mediterranean coast through to the Dilmun civilization based in the Bayran and Oman areas. This was a golden financial opportunity to stretch their wings to do business deals with neighboring countries. This trade route assisted the Ubad township into a pottery empire. And thanks to the invention of the wheel, what's really innovative about using this technology, they were able to make quite curvy bottom base of the bowl, which is interesting. Prior to that, it used to be flat based, but this one is kind of a nifty invention. Rather letting their farming profits go into deficit, they took their pottery industry and agricultural innovation one step further, irrigation. Their next groundbreaking technology amplified their agricultural production on a whole new level. This opened the floodgates to a new export market. The Ubad civilization was a culture developed in three sub-branches. The peasant farmers, the nomad herders, and the hunter-gatherer recluses, as you can see here. The Ubay timeline comes in three parts. Iridu, Haji Muhammad, then along came another new invention that saw the real estate market explode into a property boom. And this is the third stage. Urbanization. This is just an artist's impression how it looked back then. As the population grew, so did the settlements, as you can see in front of you. As with any booming economy, money in the form of pottery was spent big on public infrastructure like canal networks to supply water to nearby settlements. As you can see in this artist impression, there's several canals right here that stretch all the way to the coastal edge of Ubad Township. Their urbanization model expanded hugely from an urban city to a suburban district. These little suburbs were divided into allotments that coincide with the Ubaid city. It was no longer a friendly neighborhood community. It became a boisterous and bustling place as this artist's impression demonstrates. Their economy was dependent on the trade route exports based on pottery, grains, canal networks, irrigation, and agriculture. They were the first to introduce a centralized coordination of labor, a hired labor workforce like you see today. This is all thanks to trade route negotiations with Arabia and Bayran, demand needed to be met for the farmers in search of slave labor. This encouraged a paid labor force. Maybe they were paid greatly, maybe they were paid very little, maybe they weren't paid at all, probably next to nothing. Although it was not an encouraging take proposition for the farmers, this brought on the early onset of migration to Ubaid. This is a map that just demonstrate the mass migration that happened, or should I say it started all the way from the north and then they made their way down, f settling in nearby suburbs as you can see here. And then they made their way all the way down to Tel El Ubad and township of Ur and Urudu to be near the coastal edge. I mean, why not? Who doesn't? But that is just an indication of the mass migration that happened that time. Ever since the introduction of urbanization slash suburban living from 4500 to 4000 BC, urban living became the norm. Compare it to new housing estates. Now, as you can see, what gets me about these housing estates, they all look the same. Why is that? Is this a cheap way of developing a home? I don't know, but they just look the same as like 
any other real estate development. Get a land package, a mortgage, build your dream home, and voila! Welcome to your new neighborhood. All thanks to the trade routes, the economy was booming. The price of property monetized with pottery and grains as currency at the time couldn't possibly crash, could it? This brought on an encouraging wave of families for the first home owner by a market. They were the first to introduce multi-roomed rectangular style homes similar to living in a townhouse or apartment if you've seen them in your neighborhood during the urbanization movement suburbia was born yes to build your nest you must have stuff to fill it like pottery sickles stone and metal which all date to around 5000 bc along with the new technology of urbanization something else cropped up from it domestication they were the first to introduce an elite society yes a class of their own hereditary class of chief dance to manage temples shrines granaries meditate conflict within a family group like a community counselor and maintain social order like law enforcement this hierarchical society was governed mainly by the male passed down by the previous paternal leader to be the next in line to the kingdom as you can see here this became leadership in turn created a centralized power to control the masses erratic and sometimes carefree behavior they introduced the first written tablet of 32 laws it is called the code of ur nam nu the law code it was derived from Sumer and dates between 2100 to 2050 bc it was supposedly written and delegated amongst his political sect a king called ur namu of ur his son Shalgi also participated in the lawmaking process and that was a very common thing to do amongst the elite during that time. This book of common law was introduced under centralized power. Thus, top dog decides and delegates through diplomatic means on how you live, behave, think, act and speak. It was a new form of centralized government so these rules were designed to control the rate of crime capital punishment control obedience surveillance of the masses litigation cases and monetary compensation for bodily damage this was a centralized society near communism but a little bit of democracy added into the ingredients based on control of the monetary system this was called the sumerian renaissance or thanks to the trade route negotiations with arabia and Bahrain. just like the sumerians they loved music of course wouldn't anyone they synced it with religious holidays ceremonies and public festivities as you can see this is an example of a musical instrument called the lyre or the stringed harp and yes blue collar workers living below their means were jealous of their neighbors grand mansion the rise of the haves and have nots needing to fit in so they did their best too keeping up with the kardashians i mean who wouldn't people from all walks of life migrated to your bad area they saw it as the land of opportunity the promised land the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow to come out of the harshness of the hunter gatherer life and embrace the intoxicated ideal of the settled domesticated lifestyle as you can see according to this artist's impression it was a great place to live everyone wanted to be rich everyone wanted a home of their own everyone wanted a piece of paradise everyone wanted a family of their own and most of all everyone wanted success but for every booming economy there is always a price to pay the Ubaid civilization came to an abrupt end in 3800 BC in the 
Eastern Arabia and the Oman Peninsula. What caused it? Not war, disease or famine. It was climate change. Lakes were getting lower, less rainfall and a whole lot more sand dunes developed. The Ice Age had done its job. A new form of living arose called nomadism the royal desert wanderers. Yes, the area they loved and thrived turned into a barren wasteland. It was so dried up, it stayed that way for a thousand years. Today, the Ubad period is gone, disappeared in the mists of time. Archaeologists have found the actual place, as you can see here, that was Ubaid called Tel Al Ubaid or Mount Ubaid, and this is what's left of it. It's a small site measuring 500 metres north to the south and 300 metres east to west and extends about 2 metres above ground level. The site was discovered in 1919 by Henry Hall. Charles Leonard Woolley excavated the site in 1923 to 1924, followed by Seton Lloyd and Pinhas de Lugas in 1937. The lower level of the site came with an array of artifacts scoured amongst the area like pottery, kilns, temples and a cemetery. And to their amazement, sailing was an introduced technology in the Ubaid period. And this followed on with the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, and so forth adopted this technology in order to voyage to new lands and faraway territories to do their merchant business and their trade deals with other neighboring countries. So it was a very interesting time with this newfound technology. They also uncovered a wall that surrounded the temple of Nin Her Sag at the summit points to sailing as their earliest evidence found in Kuwait. And this is just an artist's impression of how it supposedly looked the temple back then. And the architecture is quite impressive. Now, you got a good mental picture of the Ubad civilization. However, something struck me like a slap over the head. It's this. I know, this looks really bizarre. Like a bizarre find in a bizarre shop. But they found these funny looking statues in the area. And have a look at their faces carefully. What does that tell you? Now, here's another photograph of another of these thingamajigs, these statues, figurines, whatever you want to call them. You see their faces? Just look at their faces carefully. They don't look human. They look alien. And it's not just one. They found dozens of these scattered across the site. And here's another one that depicts it, as you can see. And if you have a look at the head shape, it looks like a cone head shape. These beings are certainly not from here. They're from somewhere else. They say that the tradition was from an infant that would bind the, the head by wrapping it with a cloth around the head and try and elongate, should I say, elongate the head until it comes to adolescence close to when it's about 18 and then the elongated head is actually formed then they unwrap the bind and it mimics this particular being so what gets me is this could it be before the book of common law was written that somehow these pre-ancients gave the Sumerians and Mesopotamians the gift of writing. Could it be so? Is it possible that these laws stamped in stone were instructed by these pre-ancient beings? Like a psychological spectrum into the human mind? Another evolutionary step towards improving our brain development? Could it be so? Now here's another one of these 
strange beings, right? Like I said, they're not human, they're alien. They're from somewhere else. They are definitely not here. Now, I'm not saying that these are Barbie dolls for kids to play with. I mean, I'm not, I mean, that's grasping straws, right? Could this be saying to you and to me that they had encounters by these space visitors, not just once or twice, but several times? They were curious about us. They didn't just come here just to have fun and waste time and ravage the place. They obviously came here on some sort of mission. And I do believe they were probably here to study us. Why? I don't know. But I will say this. I'm not dismissing that. But why us? Why were these pre-ancient beings so interested in us? Well... I'm about to find out. So, stay tuned. And that's exactly what I mean. In the meantime, I'll be investigating the Kanak Palace in Luxor, Egypt, and I'll inform you from my gained insight about the presence of these pre-ancient beings during the Yubei period. That's all for now.